Good evening. My name is Kent Wong. I'm the director of the UCLA Labor Center, and I'd like to welcome you to this month's segment of Labor's Voice. This is a monthly program that is sponsored by the Los Angeles County Federation of Labor and the UCLA Labor Center to bring you current information, current events about the extraordinary work of the Los Angeles labor movement, especially during these challenging times. So please plan to join us the third Thursday of each month at 7 p.m. Pacific time. Um, tonight's program will focus on the insurrection, on the impeachment, and on the inauguration. It has been an extraordinary few weeks since the beginning of 2021. And um, yesterday, as the country gathered to celebrate the inauguration of President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, it's also an important time for us to take a deep breath and to understand the momentous transformation that has just occurred, but also to celebrate the end of the four-year nightmare known as the Trump administration. In just a few weeks, we witnessed the extraordinary victory in Georgia that flipped control of the US Senate to the Democrats. The very next day, we witnessed an armed insurrection on the US Capitol that was incited by none other than Donald Trump. One week later, we witnessed the impeachment of Donald Trump for the second time, an extraordinary occurrence where the president was impeached on two separate occasions. This past Monday was Martin Luther King Day when the nation honored the extraordinary legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And when many of us paused to think about the lessons Dr. King taught us and their, and their relevance to the world today. And finally, yesterday was the inauguration and celebration that was uh, witnessed not only by people throughout the United States, but indeed throughout the world. And joining with me tonight are three outstanding leaders that I am fortunate enough to call as my good friends. We have with us Reverend James Lawson Jr., who was a good friend of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Reverend Lawson played a critical role in launching the Nashville sit-in movement and encouraging a new generation of social justice activists who challenged Jim Crow and segregation throughout the South. He led the Memphis sanitation workers strike and for decades has been a powerful force for social justice and social change here in Los Angeles. Joining us tonight is Tafari Gabre, the executive vice president of the AFL-CIO, the highest ranking person of color within the AFL-CIO and the first immigrant to serve in a top leadership role within the AFL-CIO. Tafari was formerly the leader of the Orange County Labor Federation that led the transformation of that labor movement and the flipping of Orange County from a red county to a blue county. Tafari also spearheaded efforts by the AFL-CIO to build that model of organizing and union transformation to five labor councils throughout the South, including Atlanta, Georgia. And finally, we have my good friend, Susan Minato, co-president of Unite Here Local 11, representing 
the hotel workers here in Southern California and in Arizona. Local 11 led the transformation of the Los Angeles labor movement in partnership with the former president, Maria Elena Dorasso and her good friend, Reverend Lawson. And Local 11 has built one of the most powerful political mobilization programs in the country that helped to secure victory in Arizona. And Susan Minato personally helped to lead 1300 Unite Here members in Georgia to help to secure that victory there. So this is a very important time to have this conversation. Um, in introducing Reverend Lawson, I wanted to share with you a few slides of the last trip that I took since the pandemic, this is before the pandemic, but um, uh, Susan Minato, uh, Ron Herrera from the Los Angeles County Federation of Labor, many other key labor leaders of Los Angeles traveled to Montgomery with Reverend Lawson back in March. And on that important week, uh, Reverend Lawson was reunited with his good friend, Congressman John Lewis. The two of them marched for the last time together over the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, accompanied by Kamala Harris, by Nancy Pelosi, and more than 20 members of Congress. Following the march over the Pettus Bridge, Reverend Lawson delivered a stirring sermon at the historic Brown Chapel in Selma, Alabama, uh, attended by more than 20 members of Congress and uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi rushed up to Reverend Lawson following his sermon and said, you must come and address the members of the US Congress. Your voice is a voice that they need to hear. And finally, um, we um, uh, had lunch with uh, uh, then Senator Kamala Harris, who uh, was eager to share with Reverend Lawson um, some of the upcoming plans at that point for the uh, uh, presidential election in November of last year. Uh, so uh, it is my great honor to welcome uh, my good friend, Reverend Lawson. And uh, the first question to him is that uh, one of Dr. Martin Luther King's um, last written works was, um, uh, where do we go from here, chaos or community? And I think that that question is very relevant to us today. And so how would you respond to uh, the question posed by uh, Dr. King? Um, welcome, Reverend Lawson. Well, thank you, Ken. It's, uh, Kent, it's uh, good to be with you. Good to be with Tello uh, Tofero and also Susan. Um, the question you pose is a critical question for USA democracy. Where do we go from here? Chaos or community? Now, the in the last in the presidential election of November third, the black community uh, voted over ninety percent. There is a great unity in the black community concerning the necessity of our moving systematically towards uh, becoming a truly just, truly equitable, uh, truly beloved community as a nation. Uh, in the uh, Asian community, it was in the 70 percent. In the Hispanic community, it was over 70 percent. The division is not in the people of color. <laughs> the people of color know that we want a democratic society. The division is in the white community where too many members of the white community have not declared their personal and their political loyalty to the founding document and its philosophy and in a sense radical uh, theory, 
We hold these truths to be self-evident that all are created equal and that all are endowed by the creator with certain unalienable rights. The division is in the largely white community, which cannot make its, up its mind whether or not it wants to be organized around racism, violence, sexism, <laughs> economic uh, impoverishment, or around a genuine uh, um, a spirit of liberty, justice, equality, and the beloved community. So, so the, I'm going I'm I'm to say that very boldly and lay it out. <laughs> uh, there are five, there are five communities in the presidential election, November the 3rd, will demonstrate those communities numbering upwards of 110 million of our people, 330 million people. In those communities, there is a massive, overwhelming understanding that justice and equality and opportunity and access for all must prevail. It is in the white community where there is great chaos. <laughs> so somehow that, that posing the question in that way, you see, I'm pushing us in another direction. <laughs> chaos or community. And already more than a third of our nation in population, the people of color, the Jewish community in the vote are largely of one mind, not 51% to 50%, but 90%, 70%, 76%. The Indian community is the same way. It's that's two or three million people in our country. It's the same way. It's committed to having a society that, that is moving far closer to being an ideal society in terms of the cap capacity, in terms of the access of every single person in our society for opportunity. And Reverend Lawson, you've addressed this critical challenge facing the nation, and that is the racial divide. Yes. And it is clear that the yeah. vast majority of white voters, mm -hmm. in spite of everything that has occurred in the last four years, voted for Donald Trump for president. Yes. And yet, it was the communities of color, mm -hmm. by overwhelming majorities, especially the African American community, that resoundedly rejected the presidency of Trump and saw the necessity of advancing a change agenda. So how do you interpret that in terms of what needs to be done to advance the beloved community and to advance an agenda for change? Well, I, I think it means that the people of color basically in the United States will have to continue to um, perfect our unity towards justice and then that we're going to have to do a job of persuading um, uh, more people in the white community uh, to stop uh, <laughs> to stop uh, uh, what's the word hemahawing <laughs> uh, to 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 get into this battle i think that that the, the second task has to be probably to encourage the Democratic Party to really become the party of 330 million people on the side of justice, equality, uh, and, and liberty. And that, to be on that side means we have to dis continue to dismantle every form uh, of racism or fear or violence or plantation capitalism that harms other human beings in our society. Absolutely. We, we, um, could you comment on uh, your thoughts about the uh, huge mass upsurge in the movement for Black Lives in the year 2020 and what that signals with regard to a uh, national demand for racial justice? Well, uh, it fulfills my predictions or my, my 
teachings of the past 20, 30 years, that in the 21st century, we have to have a continuation of nonviolent struggles that uh, um, uh, make what we did in the 27th, uh, at, at 20th century uh, uh, seem not enough <laughs> at all in relationship to the changes. Black Lives Matter has brought to the United States in 2021 the largest nonviolent campaign ever in the history of our country. Some 25 million people, according to the scholars, have participated. There have been over 8,000 de specific demonstrations in all 50 states. These have occurred in 25 USA localities. Now, that's what the, that's what the, some of the scholars of people's movement are reporting in the last two or three months. So it's magnificent. And for the first, they're not only, they're not only going after the end of racial justice, but they have now specified very clearly that the violence of racism has to be dismantled. The, the country has never had a debate over what kind of law enforcement we need for a democratic society. Law enforcement has grown out of a kind of a rough neck personality all over the country, the Wyatt Earps, <laughs> uh, the Wild Bill Hickox, you know, uh, it's grown out of that sort of dimension in which uh, police uh, do the dirty work for <laughs> maintaining order and protecting property. So uh, the Black Lives Matter is now demanding that the nation discuss. Do we have to have police officers who care for traffic with armed, with weapons and armory? <laughs> or is traffic something that could be um, uh, in a, a department maybe of, of the police that is an unarmed uh, scene because many of the many of the stops that have killed black people and Hispanic people have been traffic stops. <laughs> Absolutely. And the disparities in terms yes. of how the police respond was so exactly. evident That's on January 6th when you had a group of white vigilantes, uh, you know, homegrown terrorists storming the US Capitol uh, with so few um, acts of violence against the um, people who are um, trying to disrupt the uh, American election process in many instances where the police uh, let them through the barricades and uh, welcomed them in to the US Capitol. Uh, this is a far cry from the way that police all across the country have yeah. viciously responded to the movement for black lives. And so that is a clear reflection of the racial disparity. Uh, one of the things that you've taught us, however, uh, Reverend Lawson, in, in this whole notion of plantation capitalism is the necessity of linking the fight for racial justice and the fight for economic justice. So I, I was wondering if you could expound on what you see as uh, some of the future directions for the movement for black lives, linking issues of racial and economic justice. Well, I think many of them do. Uh, because the Black Lives Network was pretty much organized by uh, three major women, Black women, across the country. Uh, they, they have some 16 to 20 organized networks in various places in the country. Um, and th the issue of uh, gender has been a very important issue to them. So I think that BLM understands some of these connections. Uh, but again, I think it's important that we acknowledge that the vulnerable population in the United States at this point towards being a, having a consensus for a genuinely powerful uh, democratic society is lodged in the white community and not in the, pe not in the people of color. Reverend Lawson, could you uh, comment? You know, we uh, uh, witnessed the inauguration of uh, President Joe Biden and Vice President uh, Kamala Harris yesterday. Uh, 
And uh, this is a, a, a huge momentous change uh, for this country. Um, and yet they're inheriting a pandemic. They're inheriting the worst economic crisis since the 1930s. So uh, what are your hopes and expectations uh, for the new Biden-Harris administration? Uh, well, I hope that what he, what he did today will be, be done the next 99 days, <laughs> systematically look at where the repair work has to begin in the federal government, because the Republicans have for more than 40 years deliberately tried to sabotage governance. In the 21st century, they have closed down government. I happen to think that conversation politically in the nation has to be about a political party that has again and again closed down federal government and threatened to close it down. They obviously are not interested in governing if Trump is an example of their work. So I think we the people have to move towards a conversation in which there's a realignment of the two parties. Uh, uh, the, the, I think that issue has to be faced forward. When you have so many Republican elected officials claiming, claiming that the November 3rd election was fraud, when 98 governors, or rather 100, 100 secretaries of state and governors, both Republican and Democrat, have cert certified that their state election, which they oversee, was an election of integrity with little fraud. That's their testimony to have then Republicans in Congress claiming there was fraud when the folk who have to manage the federal election insist that they ran a good election. Uh, I think that to me at least that is a scary collision which could completely undermine this nation. Uh, I agree. It could um, completely I, undermine the nation. So absolutely. So absolutely. So, and and I'm. I think the the Biden beginning just in 24 hours, but his insistence that we have a hundred must have a hundred days. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, I want to see what all he tries to do. He's trying to clearly bring into government more uh, talented people and competent human beings uh, who are less uh, concerned for domination and control, much more concerned for uh, the competency of our government and the effectiveness of a democratic society. Uh, so we should see, but I would warn the labor movement the church movement very clearly that and BLM the the major push for uh, economic racial social justice today that after the hundred days we may need to be in the street in a great deal in order to put the kind of pressure on a re democratic congress and a democratic president that will enable them to overcome the the fragility of conviction in the white community. Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, my final question is uh, that, uh, you know, although uh, all of the major civil rights historians have uh, captured and written up um, uh, your uh, works in the, uh, in the Freedom Rides and the lunch counter sit-ins and the Memphis Sanitation Workers Strike, um, in addition, you have invested tremendous time, energy and resources in helping to support the transformation of the U.S. labor movement, and so I, I wanted to probe, you know, why that has been such a priority in your life and your career. Because at the very at the very heart of most injustice is the issue of whether human beings with their families can develop a sustainable confident life with the sort of economic resources that will enable them to do it. 
we are no longer a tribal world. We're no longer an agricultural world. We are a world where folk have to have all kinds of work. And, and so that, that, that to me is a central development. I happen to think that probably the cultural uh, change in our nation is far better than what we know. When some of the white men I saw in January 6 complain about this used to be a white country, and, and uh, it's at least clear to me that that they've been blind. <laughs> they haven't seen, they haven't felt, they can't hear anything because this nation has of course, never been <laughs> a white Christian nation. Um, so it, 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 I, I, I come back to this because I think that the vulnerable, the, the, the weakness of our democratic society is a weakness that is largely lodged, lodged in the white community. We have not done the work there in education to help sufficient numbers of our people in the light of the insurrection and betrayal of democracy by Donald Trump. It would seem to me that the nation should have been, you know, 70 to 89 percent against re-election for him, not a mere uh, 81 to 74 million, but a hundred million. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, 40 or 50 million. And, and, and the fact that that did not happen to me, while I am pleased that the change has occurred and is occurring, and that we did not elect him the second, re-elect him, uh, I think we have to be in the movement, we have to be anxious. We have to be very wary I agree. The greatest, the greatest changes in our society in the last 120 years have come about because there were people's movements on the move, doing street drama, nonviolent drama, that caused the presidents to gain courage and to direct Congress to the kinds of legislation that had great uplifting benefits for all Americans. More of that is what we must have. Thank you, Reverend Lawson, for your inspiring words. Uh, it is always uh, such a pleasure uh, to be in your presence. Uh, I have one last announcement I wanted to make, uh, and that, uh, that is that uh, the building you see behind me is, uh, has been the home of the UCLA Downtown Labor Center uh, for the past 19 years. Uh, we are now in the process of purchasing this building to make a permanent home for the UCLA Labor Center. And we will soon be renaming it the Reverend James Lawson Worker Justice Center. So I am working with uh, our good friend, Maria Elena Dorasso from the State Senate and other friends in the California State Legislature to um, uh, make this uh, an official naming of uh, the building uh, in your honor and to ensure that the work that you have dedicated your life to will continue uh, in perpetuity. Uh, and so I just wanted to make that announcement that we're very excited about that. And you will be hearing more about that as this project unfolds in the coming months. Can't you did it again. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, I do want to uh, uh, introduce my good friend, Tafari Gabre, the Executive Vice President of the AFL-CIO, who uh, formerly uh, helped lead a uh, major transformation of the labor movement and of uh, political power in Orange County. Um, so welcome to Fari. And the first question to you is, how did that process of transformation occur in Orange County? And what are the lessons for the rest of the labor movement? Thank you, Kent. And um, um, I could just listen to Reverend Lawson all night without saying a word. and. Uh, uh, it is re really uh, an honor and a privilege really to be on the same stage with Reverend Lawson anytime, anywhere. And uh, I just 
when I have the chance right now, I just want to let him know that how much I love him and appreciate him and um, how yeah. much of a student of his I am. It's very, um, very true. Uh, uh, so uh, that being said, it, it, you know, um, uh, Orange County, uh, uh, a subject I love to talk about all the time. Um, and that's not because of what I did, uh, because, but that's because of what I witnessed uh, people do. Um, it's not what I did. It is the dreamers of Orange County did. It's not what I did. It's the coalition of Accord in Orange County did. It's not what I did. It is the clergy in Orange County coming together and demanding justice. Uh, all we did was we tried to facilitate that change and speed it up. Uh, we knew something was happening in there. Um, uh, as uh, uh, you know, Kent, I used to work at the California Labor Federation and we used to call Orange County the drive over county. Uh, that is, we do stuff in Los Angeles and we drive over the five freeway and, uh, and go do things in, uh, uh, in San Diego. So um, you, some of you may not remember this. Um, you know, we have one in California, uh, you know, we all have won very, very significant victories, but a lot of them happen to be defensive victories from, from Prop 226 to Prop 75 to Prop 32. Everything we did, once they came after us, we actually played very good defensive games. And uh, I would make the case that helped transform the state, helped us imagine bigger things, uh, um, uh, uh, just the lessons we learned through those fights. So when I was at the state fed, we decided that we need to have something offensive and we need to do something. And we passed through the legislature, one of the most transformational legislation I think California ever did. That was to fix healthcare, a bill which have required every employer who has more than 25 employees to provide healthcare to their employees or they have to pay to a state fund to cover every California. Just imagine non-union Walmart being held accountable to the same standards that Safeway and everybody else has. Non-union hotels being required to actually adhere to healthcare standards to their employees that organized, hotel, organized hotels do. So we passed that bill through the state legislature and that was the last bill Gray Davis signed into law before he got recalled. So the other side doesn't just sit down and take it. So what they did was they collected signature and they qualified it and they put it on the ballot and that was Prop 72. I am bringing this up because I think it's important to talk about the Orange County story. So what happened was in November of 20, the, 2004, we ended up losing Prop 72, one of the biggest achievements we had legislatively in California by 0.6 percentage of the vote. We ended up getting 49.4% of the vote. That required all of us to do soul searching. Where did we drop the ball? So we looked at every local union, every state council, every labor council, all the work that happened. And what we saw was that initiative was lost in Orange County, California. Essentially, union members in Orange County voted identical to the general public in Orange County, which tells you there was no program, there was nothing happening. And that told me that unless we fix Orange County, we're kidding ourselves to say California is a progressive state. And that's what drove me into quitting my job at the California Labor Federation and moving into Orange County to do things. And once I got into Orange County, what I found was really energetic organizers, community groups who were doing everything without nothing. So all we did was we brought a labor movement that actually can facilitate that change to happen. And we invested in the community. We treated our community partners as one of us. And a lot of the credit, Kent, you are a big, huge part of that. Uh, a lot of the credit also goes to our local unions who bought into that vision and uh, uh, despite bad habits and everything else, bought into that vision and allowed the community to actually flourish. And 
you know, you know, and we saw when you engage on year round organizing and when you engage investing, not in politicians, but in communities, not in the politicians, but trying to change the mind of the voters, not the politicians, we saw the results that what, what, what could happen. And I can't tell you, I can't believe Orange County is a place like people like Kerry Porter come into the, into the legislature to actually be members of Congress. That is possible when we focus on our lane, when we focus on our calling, and that is organizing and organizing and organizing and organizing. So that's, I think if we can't do that in Ruby Red, Orange County, there is no reason why we cannot win South Carolina. There is no reason why we cannot change Texas. There is no reason why we cannot change the country. But in order that to happen, we have to do less politics and more organizing. When we do that, everything will align itself. Yes, that's right. And, and Orange County has really uh, shown the nation what can be done. Uh, through organizing, through labor community alliances, and through advancing an agenda for social justice. Uh, when you were elected executive vice president, uh, you tried to uh, implement that model in other parts of the country. So I want you to talk a little about why you selected critical uh, cities in the South and the impact that that had. Well, look, the South is where the battle is. Uh, the South is where the battle is. That's not because people in the South are bad. It is because the rest of us had given up on the South a long time ago. And we gave up on the South on our own peril because you cannot win in the North. You cannot win in the West. You cannot win anywhere else without actually winning in the South. So I'll just give you some examples. One out of every four tires you drive on starting next year will come from one state, from South Carolina. These are tire manufacturers who used to be in Ohio, tire manufacturers who used to be in upstate New York, tire manufacturers who used to be in Illinois, relocating to South Carolina to chasing deregulation, chasing union-free environment, paying poverty wages. So practically, the South is becoming an offshoring of good jobs place. If you want to protect jobs in Seattle, you have to organize in South Carolina because Boeing pays a fraction of the wages and the benefits it pays in Seattle to workers in South Carolina who work in the, 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 at the Boeing plant in South Carolina. That's not a sustainable model. You can't not fight that fight just in Seattle and in Washington state because you have a better environment when you have a competitive disadvantage within the United States. Mm. So it is on all of us. So I have always believed that if we say who we are, we have to go to wherever the problems are. The highest, the, the, the highest level of uninsured people live in the South most people, most kids in the poverty live in the, in the South. Most kids who have the worst education, public education system live in, in the South. So if we don't care about those things, what are we? It mm. is in the heart of our movement. It's in the heart of the workers' movement. So especially when you look at places like Houston, Texas, if you look at the places like Dallas, Texas, Miami and Orlando in Atlanta, they look like Los Angeles. They don't have anything in common with everything else that you hear about the South. But they act like the South because we have not organized in there and we have not invested in there. So that's why the five cities strategy that we launched in, 2000, in, in, in 2014 uh, were based on that, based on the model of actually what Miguel Contreras and the Los Angeles labor movement did. When you bring the community and bundle it up with the labor movement and focus on organizing, you can change anything and everything. And you're seeing the results of that from you know, the largest county in, in Texas, Harris County, practically performs like the, the, the largest county in, in Los Angeles right now because organizers are organizing it. And that's why you're changing mass, you're seeing massive changes in those places, not because uh, you know two months ahead of time in that election year, people are pouring in money. It is changing because 
people like Stacey Abrams are organizing year round and in investing in people, not in politicians. And that's changing those places. And I think that's the formula that's changing our country. Absolutely. So uh, we really want to thank you for your visionary leadership uh, within the AFL-CIO that's been advocating for years the necessity of building that type of power strategy in critical parts of the South. And that is a strategy that we saw pay off and succeed uh, you know, in uh, uh, this election in Georgia. Um, I wanted to turn uh, you know, briefly uh, to your reflections on the uh, events earlier this month. Uh, your, uh, your office is right across the street from the White House. Uh, you are blocks away from the insurrection that took place on January 6th. Uh, so I want you to uh, provide uh, a reflection and analysis of what happened on January 6th and um, uh, what does that say in terms of the state of the nation? Uh, Ken, um, I'm just since the Reverend has, has been straightforward and honest and I'm gonna try to be as honest as, uh, as possible and not couch myself uh, uh, in, in talking to all, all of us tonight. Uh, some of us predicted this could happen. And I think our nation's problem is our own exceptionalism. American exceptionalism has become to say things happen in other countries that, does, that don't happen here. I have heard from a lot of people that we have checks and balances in this country and things like this could not happen. Well, we were within minutes of our government being overthrown. Literal. I mean, you are seeing people, including pillow salespeople, going and advising a president of the United States to mobilize the military and to stay in power after he lost his election. Well, I think this is a wake up call for all of us. Our democracy is delicate. Our democracy is as good as we could have it tomorrow, not as, not, not as good as we had it yesterday. And we have to keep our eyes focused on that. But that being said, Ken, also we have to be honest, does our democracy actually even it, in, in its current form work? We still have Jim Crow rules that actually put us in the positions that we were. The Congress would not be meeting to certify the electoral college if we had one man, one vote in this country. So can we be from the labor movement and other progressive organizations, can we be bold enough actually to imagine and demand one man, one vote? We know how this works for them and why do we have to deal with stuff that that only works for them? Absolutely. So um, uh, my last question, Tafari, is that uh, um, I know that uh, um, labor and communities of color secured the victory of the Biden-Harris election. It was labor and communities of color that secured the victory in Georgia, which flipped control of the Senate. Um, but moving forward, what is the role of labor in ensuring that uh, the Biden-Harris administration um, comes through uh, with a uh, agenda that will truly serve the interests of uh, working people of all colors uh, throughout this country? Well, I'm, I'm gonna try to answer that as quickly as possible. I know we're, we're, we're running out of time. You probably need a whole webinar on, 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 on on, on that issue. Uh, I hope we learn our lesson from 2009. A house full of Democrats, a president of open change, 60 senators, and we still never passed immigration reform, never passed a meaningful democracy reform, never passed the Employee Free Choice Act. So it is on us if we allow that to happen again. But as an organizer, I got to call on people that you have who are watching us right now. We have a problem in the United States Senate. And one of our problems comes from California. We need you to lean on Senator Feinstein. That if it is going to require 
to busting the flowbuster, to pass the Voting Rights Act, we have to do it. If it's gonna require busting the flowbuster, to pass the PRO Act so workers can organize again in this country, we have to do it. And more importantly, the president has sent his immigration reform bill, however incomplete, to Congress. We're never gonna find 60 votes for it. We have to have Democrats to have the backbone to pass it with 51 votes. That is the only way you pay back people of color who have put you in power. We cannot accept politics as usual. Thank you, Tafari Gabre. It is uh, great to have you with us tonight. And we uh, deeply respect and appreciate the leadership that you are providing uh, to the US labor movement. Um, our final guest this evening is Susan Minato, co-president of Unite Here Local 11. And before I introduce Susan, I wanted to show a very short one minute clip uh, that celebrates the extraordinary work of this union in the streets of Georgia. Hi, my name is Angela Fisher. I'm from Hawthorne, California. I'm out here in Georgia knocking on them doors. I started the campaign uh, back in Arizona. I didn't know anything about what was going on. And when I got there, it was like, wow, this is, this is deep. You know, I went through bumps and bruises, but I managed to come through. I have seen my growth um, from when I first started. My fight has gotten stronger. I'm stronger. Um, I've got to a point where I help train people. It's something that is really uh, awesome to me that I was chosen in that era. Coming back here to Georgia, you know, since I lived here for 13 years, you know, it's, it's an honor to me to come help fight for this uh, Senate seat, the two Senate seats, you know, because not just for Georgia, but for everybody. So thank you so much. I appreciate Unite Here for choosing me again to come knock on some doors. Susan, the country owes you and the sisters and brothers of Unite Here a debt of gratitude and the extraordinary work that you helped to lead in Arizona to flip that state, the extraordinary work that you helped to lead when 1,300 Unite Here activists mobilized in the streets during the middle of a pandemic helped to secure the victory that we are celebrating today. So uh, Susan, tell me a little about how this happened, how Unite Here put together this operation in Arizona and Georgia. Well, um, you know, in, in both uh, my brother, Safari and Reverend Moss had referred to this, uh, Unite Here, Local 11 especially, you know, a lot under the guidance of Reverend Mawson, uh, we're a movement building local, you know, and what we do is we, we develop leadership and we do it over time and we never stop doing it. So we also participate in political elections, and that's important for us to do, and you know sometimes more important than others. Um, but uh, we do that as uh, you know as to supplement the movement building work. And so in Arizona, we uh, I think I started working there in 2006. We had a team come in from New Haven even uh, in 2005. Um, we just kept you know we started to build the union really. And you know, we uh, did we organized um, our hotel program. Uh, I think we won about five hotels or six hotels over the period, um, and so and then began to do political elections. And we were able to turn uh, the Republican Phoenix City Council into a Democratic one. Um, are currently a housekeeper, former housekeeper from the Century Plaza Hotel in Los Angeles, local eleven member from Compton, California is the vice mayor of Phoenix as a result of some of that political work. And uh, so this is sort of like what we do and both of them have described this. Um, it is a worker driven movement because I'm one person, you know, our membership and the people they know and their families and their churches and the community groups, they are all part of change. And so that's what we did um, and have been doing uh, we took a little turn in 2018, where we decided to do a national race, which was the U.S. Senate race for Kirsten Cinema, and we're successful in that. Um, and then uh, that sort of led us to the natural progression uh, to the 2020 general election. 
uh, Local 11, which has been involved in many, many political elections in California, merged with, with Arizona in 2017 for the express reason to flip Arizona in 2020, November. Uh, for both, you know, presidential as well as the U.S. Senate race with Mark Kelly. So, uh, so that's how it started. <laughs> it's amazing that there's so many similarities between what uh, Tafari and uh, the activists of Orange County did to flip Orange County, and what uh, uh, Susan and the other uh, Unite Here Local 11 activists did to flip Arizona. Uh, and now I want to uh, switch to Georgia because I thought it was so inspiring that a multiracial group of union activists, 1300 strong, went to Georgia uh, and helped to determine the outcome of that election. So uh, how did that happen? Well, um, so I should say that uh, you, you recall there's a pandemic <laughs> and uh, during the pandemic, nobody was going into the street just no one. And we all know, you know, if, we're, if, if you're an organizer, you know, you're never going to mobilize many people unless you talk to them face to face, because you have to reach them and touch them. And so I, I don't mean literally touch them, I mean, touch their hearts. And uh, so we decided that we must go in the field. And we decided this um, after having some uh, returning some people to work here in Los Angeles to help feed senior citizens uh, through our hospitality training academy. Um, and so we developed the COVID protocols to do it in Arizona. Uh, so we pushed out the door in July and then uh, were successful, as I said earlier. And then the Nevada team, same thing. They were very successful in Nevada. The Florida team, not quite as successful. They didn't turn Florida, but they actually won every down ballot race. So, you know, you don't win everything the first time out. Um, and then our Philadelphia team, uh, Pennsylvania team. Uh, they did a big uh, Philadelphia push with more than 500 people with my uh, sister president, uh, Rosalind Wasinich, Nicole Hunt, and uh, Reverend Scott Marks from New Haven. And so they, you know, pushed Philadelphia, I think, and pushed Pennsylvania over the top or helped to. And so we decided as a union, you know, we, we, we uh, in Arizona said, okay, everybody, we did well here, but there's still an imbalance in the Senate. So shall we go to Georgia? And resoundingly, yes. And so we picked up the entire team, more than 500 people from, from our you know, local and, and, and activists, picked up, went to Georgia on November 28th and joined the Nevada team, the Florida team, the Philly team, Chicago joined in, uh, Baltimore joined in. And so we had, you know, as you said, more than 1300 people from Unite Here and we reached uh, our secretary treasurer, Gwen Mills, reached out to Stacey Abrams and said, we're ready to hit the road anytime, any place. And she, she understood that when you win Georgia by 11,000 votes in the first flip, you're probably not gonna win a runoff race without help. And so we went out there, did our work, brought a, even brought a lot of our community activists with us. And so it was truly uh, an inspiring, inspiring campaign. What's remarkable is that this was done during the pandemic. So how did you uh, ensure the uh, safety of the 1300 activists who are going door to door? Well, I alluded to it earlier. We have a training academy in Los Angeles called the Hospitality Training Academy. I'm the chair of the board. And so during the pandemic, when all of the major hospitality workplaces in Los Angeles were closed you know, due to the pandemic, uh, uh, the government figured out that they were needed to feed their senior citizens, otherwise they would just starve, you know, because they were, couldn't come out of the house. So we developed a program using FEMA and emergency monies through California um, to uh, do what we do best, which is we cook and pack and, you know, put together food. It was delivered by unemployed taxi drivers and uh, sent to the senior citizens. So we kept developing and honing our ability to figure out COVID and how to do it safely. And then we called on epidemiologists um, that uh, a, a special one from, from Arizona who has been helping school systems across the country to reopen. And her name is Dr. Saskia Popescu. And she helped us to develop our door-to-door -door program. 
And so Local 11, I feel very proud of this, Local 11 developed it, you know, pushed, our, pushed ourselves, pushed Unite Here, pushed others to get out the door. And I think, you know, ultimately, you know, we saw the success from the door to door. The determination, the courage, the heroism of those 1300 uh, Unite Here uh, members and activists, it really does remind us of uh, the people that Reverend Lawson was organizing, you know, uh, back during the uh, sit-in campaign and during the uh, Memphis sanitation workers strike that uh, ordinary people can do extraordinary things uh, when they set their minds to work together and to change the world. And um, uh, tell me a little about how you uh, were able to address issues of racial justice, even in the midst of the campaign and how you were able to uh, educate and develop uh, the leaders on the ground. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, as a trainer myself, um, training is probably one of the most difficult things to do because you're asking a person to get over fear. And so, uh, and, it's, and it's even worse when you uh, have grown up, you know, under siege by police. And so, and in Georgia specifically, you know, it is a very, very uh, painful place. Um, you feel the he racial heaviness in the air. Um, the, you know, there's a, people have spoken about a, a burgeoning Asian population. It's true, there is one, it's relatively small people are completely invisible there. You know, Asians are invisible. Latino, it's growing, but, and it's important, but it is also like somewhat on the side. It is a very black and white place in Georgia. And so uh, under the, under, you know, sort of our basic training methods of reaching people and, and helping them through fear, um, combined with uh, Reverend Scott Marks, who and Stephanie Greenlee, who are two black leaders in Unite Here, the two you know two of the highest ranking black leaders in Unite Here, and Reverend Lawson has guided the black leaders group of Unite Here. Um, they they provided some context, and to all of our voters, I mean all of our our, our canvassers, and so we had lessons, you know, where we interjected a little bit of history. A little bit of language, you know, learning how to use the the, the terminology of systemic racism and institutional racism, and then the leaders got on the doors, and so we just had to do a lot of special care because people had a lot of fear and worries, and you know, totally substantiated, <laughs> and so uh, a lot of guns out there in Georgia too, so um, yeah. So we, we, we spent a lot of effort uh, being very careful about that. Well, congratulations, Susan Minato and the Sisters and Brothers of Unite Here uh, for helping to secure this victory. It is an untold story. You know, uh, while, while I'm thrilled with the extraordinary leadership of Stacey Abrams, of Congressman John Lewis, of others who uh, worked for years and years to um, uh, change the political environment in Georgia, uh, the role of labor still has not been adequately covered. And so uh, we really salute you, uh, Susan, and the, uh, the work of Unite Here. And uh, we know that this is the way to build a movement, you know? Uh, so I really wanted to thank our guests tonight, um, uh, Reverend Lawson, for continuing to inspire us all, uh, for Tafari Gabre and your courageous leadership uh, in the AFL-CIO and uh, the visionary uh, leadership you have provided to our movement and for uh, co-president Susan Minato in one of the most dynamic uh, kick-ass unions in the country, Unite Here to Local 11. And uh, you should be very proud of what your union has been able to accomplish. Please join us again for next month's uh, Labor's Voice. It will be the third Thursday at uh, seven o'clock Pacific time. And uh, we hope that all of you will celebrate uh, this inauguration, celebrate this new administration and work with us to ensure the change that our country desperately needs and wants. Thank you and good night.